Most people want peace most of the time. That's a problem for rulers bent on war. History teaches that rulers arranging for their country to be attacked, or appear to be attacked, is the fastest method for these rulers to get their way when they want war. If 9-11 is not such a deception, it's an exception to the rule. August 2, 1990. Iraq attacks Kuwait, claiming the Kuwaitis are slant drilling into Iraq's oil fields. U.S. President George Herbert Walker Bush pushes for a land war against Iraq, but polls show the U.S. public is split 50-50 on that idea. Then comes this eyewitness testimony before a congressional committee from a 15-year-old Kuwaiti, 15-year-old Kuwaiti girl. While I was there, I saw the Iraqi soldiers come into the hospital with guns. They took the babies out of incubators. took the incubators and left the children to die on a cold floor. The U.S. public is outraged. The result? Support for land war zooms. It's a turning point. Desert Storm is launched. 135,000 Iraqis are killed. An estimated one million, one million Iraqis, many of them children and old people, then die as a result of 10 years of sanctions. One small problem. There never were any incubator baby deaths, not one. The Canadian Broadcasting Corporation's investigative flagship program, The Fifth Estate, reveals the girl to be the Kuwaiti ambassador's daughter, given her lines and coached in acting by the giant American PR firm Hill & Knowlton. It's one phase in a $10 million joint, joint U.S.-Kuwaiti campaign of deception. This man is lying. I myself buried 14 newborn babies that had him from their incubators. This man is lying. And they had kids in incubators, and they were thrown out of the incubators so that Kuwait could be systematically dismantled. There were a lot of people who participated in a conspiracy. Yes, an out-and-out -out conspiracy of fake organizations, false documents, fraud, and disinformation. Hitler proposed a world free from communism. The state would have totalitarian control with a dictator at its head. The Nazis masterminded the torching of the Reichstag, the German parliament buildings, on February the 27th, 1933, one week before a national election. That they did so is historical fact. Portrayed best in William L. Shirer's masterpiece, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. Within hours, Hitler and his henchmen designate the communists as the villains and label them terrorists. The government promises proof, but never provides it. The communists did not do it. A single communist was the patsy. The big lie of who torched the Reichstag is used by Hitler to sow fear. He bullies the German president to sign a decree, suspendent to sign a decree, suspending seven main articles of the German constitution. The claim is that the fatherland, think homeland, is under threat. Ensuing arrests and murders of communists and socialists terrorize anti-Hitler dissent. In the ensuing election, Hitler does not get the majority he needs to rule. But soon after, he essentially seizes power. Adolf Hitler was appointed Chancellor of Germany in 1932. The following year, the Nazi party, with nearly 50% of the vote, swept into power during the general election. He then is free to launch preemptive strikes against other countries and wage a world war sold as patriotic. Using anti-Semitism and Aryan superiority as his rallying cry, Hitler was able to convince millions of Germans to sell their soul, and ultimately their personal freedom for the promise of a better day. The ultimate result for Germans is calamity. 600,000 civilians dead, 7.5 million homeless, their country broke and in ruins. The Reichstag was a major turning point. Could Nazism possibly gain support in the land of the free? The answer was, incredibly, yes. Last September 17th, 
I became the first journalist in U.S. history to go to the U.S. National Archives and the Library of Congress and pour over the thousands of pages of documents in both places to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt or any refutation of the facts that Prescott Bush, the grandfather of George W. Bush, and George Herbert Walker, his maternal great-grandfather for whom his daddy is named, were Nazi traitors to the country who should have been tried for treason. George Herbert Walker brought Prescott Bush first into Brown Brothers Harriman and then Union Banking Corporation. Uh, in actuality, it was anything but a bank. It was anything but a bank. It was essentially a Nazi money laundering operation that had a lot of tentacles into a lot of different other businesses. They had a shipping line called Hamburg American Line, for example, which was the first Nazi front business seized. In the early 1930s, it transported Nazi spies into the U.S., and then their promotional ads offered cash rewards to any American citizens who would go back on Hamburg American lines and proselytize for Hitler eight months after the U.S. had entered the war. Brown Brothers Harriman worked with I.G. Farben, which operated Auschwitz. The New York uh, Herald Tribune ran a front page article, Hitler's Angel has three million in U.S. Million in US Bank. And it caused a major scandal and just rocked the world of politics incredibly after being warned by the FBI and the Justice Department and the Treasury Department to cease and desist in their Nazi dealings. They had continued them until 1951. There had been 28 additional seizures of Nazi assets and Nazi business fronts between late 1942 and 1951. They had moved Nazi assets into Switzerland, Brazil, Argentina, and Panama. And they had continued to do business with their primary Nazi patron, a Nazi patron who was Fritz Thiessen, who backed Hitler beginning in 1921 and who was the wealthiest man in Germany and a steel and coal baron. In 1951, when uh, Fritz Thiessen died in Argentina, Union Banking Corporation was liquidated by the U.S. government and Prescott Bush received $1.5 million for his holdings in his Nazi business. And that was the beginning of the Bush family fortune for all intents and purposes. The Guardian of London finally got on the story internationally and they flew a renowned reporter of theirs named Duncan Campbell over to Washington to take me back to the archives and Library of Congress so that they could verify that, the, verify that these explosive documents were real and I didn't have forged copies. Uh, some very shocking documents that I saw at the Library of Congress had to do with the hearings of the McCormick-Dickstein Committee of November 1934. Show that, show that Prescott Bush and the uh, Hunt family, the Remington family, and J.P. Morgan tried to overthrow the U.S. government, assassinate FDR, and put a Hitler-style fascist state in place. I have in my possession testimony from the McCormick-Dickstein Committee in November of 1934 by one of the fascist plotters that they were going to follow Hitler's model exactly and impose martial law on the United States, round up white people that were worthless to the economy and troublemakers and Jews and put them into internment camps. And their plan was, if necessary, necessary to exterminate the people that could not be part of the effort the only reason the coup attempt in 1934 didn't succeed is that they led, they hired the wrong general to lead it, General Smedley Butler, the great Marine hero, two-time Congressional Medal of Honor winner, who worked with the plotters just long enough to be able to identify who they were and then blew the whistle on them to Congress.
Now you look at the Republican National Convention this week, and you bring Arnold Schwarzenegger to speak last night. Schwarzenegger is the son of a Nazi. He has praised Nazis. Nazis. He has praised Hitler. He talked last night in terms like, we will not falter, we will not waver, we will win this war on terror. He's a leader who doesn't, who doesn't flinch, who doesn't waver, and does not back down. Terrorism and the homeland being under attack are precisely the issues that Hitler used to subvert everything within the German system of government. This is a criminal regime. They not only emulate Hitler, but its genesis comes from Hitler. And I defy anyone, a historian, journalist, author, anyone, to come forward and disprove my premise that you cannot differentiate Hitler's invasion of Poland in 1939 and the Reichstag fire and his attempt to dominate the world from George w. George w. Bush's unprovoked invasion of Iraq and subversion of the Constitution through the Act after 9-1-1, which I submit is his Reichstag fire. If this were a dictatorship, it'd be a heck of a lot easier, <laughs> just so long as I'm the victim. Because the day of reckoning is at hand, and uh, these people are Nazis. They are practicing Nazi philosophy. They are mimicking Nazi tactics, and time is running out. We are now still in order to stay. Es wird auch in diesem Kampf nicht in Asien siegen, sondern Europa und an der Spitze jene Nation, die...